On today's episode, another Starliner status update. We learn how SpaceX will destroy the ISS and fish are going to help us to survive on Mars. The Boeing Starliner and her crew are not coming home anytime soon, but they're also totally not stranded in space, according to our latest update from NASA and Boeing officials. Here's the scoop. The timeline for Starliner's return has been pushed back yet again to an indefinite calendar date, but it's probably somewhere closer to the end of July. And NASA wants you to know that the reason is simply to conduct additional tests and not because the vehicle is stuck up there. Our old friend, NASA Commercial Crew Program Manager Steve Stitch, is back again saying, quote, Butch and Sonny are not stranded in space. Our plan is to continue to return them on Starliner and return them home at the right time. We have a little bit more work to do to get there for the final return. That work that he's referring to is a complex new thruster testing regime that will involve some new experiments conducted here on Earth to try and narrow down the cause of Starliner's thruster's failure in orbit. The new thruster testing will be performed at NASA's White Sands facility in New Mexico. NASA will take a reaction control system thruster just like those on Starliner and put it through the same profile of burns used on Starliner's approach to the ISS. The goal is to see if they can replicate the issue that caused the spacecraft to deselect those thrusters and perform inspections of them that would not be possible while in orbit. Based on the results of their ground operations, NASA could then perform some additional hot fire testing of the Starliner thrusters while docked to the station. The testing phase should be underway by now and NASA says that it might take a couple of weeks to complete. It's only after the new thruster testing and examination is finished that a new landing date for Starliner will be set. The process will also include an agency level review of the spacecraft to confirm that they have all of the data they need to understand the cause of the problems and that the spacecraft is now safe to return home. NASA officials stressed again that there is no rush or urgency to bring the veteran crew of Butch Wilmore and Sonny Williams home, and would rather spend more time gathering data from the service module before it's ejected into space. The original 45-day time limit for Starliner to remain in orbit was confirmed to be based on battery life, although Stitch says that the performance of those batteries so far indicates that they can extend the mission timeline with no risk, hinting that Starliner could now spend up to 90 days at the station. Boeing Vice President Mark Nappi also wants to assure everyone that there is no danger involved in bringing the vehicle back to Earth. He said, quote, We understand these issues for a safe return, but we don't understand these issues enough yet for us to fix them permanently. Nappy also wants you all to stop being mean to his company in the comments section. He told reporters, quote, Being a representative of Boeing and a representative of the Starliner program, it's pretty painful to read the things that are out there. We've gotten a really good test flight that's been accomplished so far, and it's being viewed rather negatively. Anyway. The whole saga is obviously not boding very well for the first official mission of the Starliner vehicle, which is supposed to launch in February 2025, and NASA seems to already be hedging their bets with the Crew Dragon vehicle. SpaceX is scheduled to fly their Crew 10 mission late next summer, but the prep timeline has been accelerated to move it in parallel with Starliner 1, meaning that Dragon could potentially launch early to facilitate the crew transfer operation next February. Speaking of the Crew Dragon, we now have confirmation that a modified version of this SpaceX vehicle will take on the historic task of destroying the International Space Station in the year 2030. NASA has selected SpaceX to develop and deliver the US deorbit vehicle. This spacecraft will ensure the ISS can be safely deorbited in a controlled manner, avoiding any risk to populated areas on the Earth. During the same briefing where we learned about Starliner, NASA's Operations Integration Manager for the ISS program, Bill Spech, was also on hand to field some additional questions, and one of them was asked about the SpaceX deorbit vehicle. Spech said, That's based off of a Dragon Heritage design. 
Once developed, NASA will take ownership of the deorbit spacecraft and operate it throughout the mission. As part of the re-entry process, the spacecraft, along with the ISS, will destructively break up upon re-entry into the Earth's atmosphere. According to a new white paper released by the space agency, the plan will be to use the Earth's natural atmospheric drag to do as much of the work as possible to slow the station down and bring it into a lower Earth orbit. Then, once the final crew has been evacuated, the deorbit vehicle will fire a large re-entry burn that provides the necessary push down into the atmosphere, where the majority of the ISS structure will burn up, and everything left over will simply fall into the ocean and settle down to the bottom. The same white paper includes a detailed analysis of the reasons why NASA chose to destroy the ISS instead of attempting to preserve the $1 trillion structure. There is a possibility where the station could be pushed up into a high enough orbit where it'll just stay there until we can figure out what to do with it. The idea was basically written off as being too expensive, too hard, and too dangerous when considering the amount of space junk that is currently orbiting up at those high altitudes. The deorbit vehicle contract with SpaceX is worth a potential $843 million, highlighting NASA's commitment to a safe conclusion of the ISS mission, but also paving the way for future commercial endeavors in low Earth orbit. The ISS has been continuously crewed for 24 years, serving as a unique platform for scientific research in microgravity, from Earth and space sciences to biology, human physiology, and physical sciences, the ISS has hosted over 3,300 experiments conducted by crew members on behalf of thousands of researchers worldwide. And after the ISS is gone, what comes next? Axiom Space is creating the Axiom Station, which will be initially attached to the ISS in 2026, then become its own station. This will nearly double the usable volume of the ISS. Axiom Station will be used for research, manufacturing, and hosting astronauts. NanoRacks, Voyager Space, and Lockheed Martin are also working on a project called Star Lab. This station features an inflatable habitat module that will launch in 2027, and will be able to host up to four crew members. These innovative stations will continue the legacy of the ISS and represent a giant leap in our journey to explore and inhabit outer space. Imagine this, you're on Mars, 54.6 million kilometers from Earth, and you need to find a way to grow food in an environment that is anything but friendly. What is the solution? Fish tanks. Yes, you heard it right. New research suggests that fish could help turn Martian regolith into fertile soil. Let's dive into the details. Mars is a tough place. It takes about seven months to get there by rocket, and sending regular supply ships isn't going to be sustainable. Future colonists will need to grow their own food. If you've seen The Martian with Matt Damon, you know some of the challenges involved with this. In the movie, he grows potatoes in Martian soil that's fertilized with his own human waste. It's effective, but not exactly practical or pleasant in real life. So, researchers are exploring some more appealing alternatives. They're looking into an aquaponics system which combines fish farming and hydroponics. The idea is to raise fish in tanks and use the nutrient-rich water to fertilize plants that are grown in the Martian soil. And this isn't just a theory, they have tested this. The atmosphere on Mars is 95% carbon dioxide, and with just a trace of the density that we have here on Earth. So that's bad. But there is some good news though. The length of a day on Mars is similar to that of Earth, and there's ice in the Martian rocks that could potentially be used as a water source. This makes the idea of growing plants with fish tank water even more exciting. The researchers set up an aquaponic system with a type of fish called tilapia. These fish help generate nutrient-rich water, which was then used to fertilize Martian regolith. The results were amazing. They managed to grow a variety of vegetables, including potatoes, tomatoes, beans, and carrots. The nutrient-rich water turned the nutrient-poor Martian soil into something that could support plant life. The setup involved providing the fish with sufficient light and other environmental stimuli, and the plants were grown in a tent that simulated the Martian environment. This innovative approach not only showed promise for Mars colonists, but also for people who are living in harsh environments here on Earth. But how exactly does this system work? 
Aquaponics is a sustainable farming method that creates a symbiotic environment. The fish produce waste, which is broken down by bacteria into nutrients. These nutrients are then absorbed by the plants, which in turn help to purify the water for the fish. So it's a closed loop system that mimics natural ecosystems, making it ideal for a place like Mars where resources are limited. The success of this experiment opens up exciting possibilities. Not only could future Mars colonists grow their own food, but they could also create a more self-sufficient and sustainable living environment. And this is crucial for long-term missions and the eventual goal of establishing a permanent human presence on Mars. Moreover, the implications of this research extend well beyond Mars. Aquaponics could revolutionize agriculture in extreme environments here on the Earth such as deserts or urban areas with limited space. It also offers a way to produce fresh food sustainably without relying on large amounts of water or chemical fertilizers. In the future, when humans are living on Mars, they might just be growing their own food with the help of a few friendly fish. This research is an exciting step forward, making Mars not just a place to visit, but a place to live. It shows that with creativity and innovation, we can overcome the challenges of living on another planet and create a sustainable future for humanity both on the Earth and beyond.